So we've got a few minutes for questions from the floor, if anyone would like to. Uh, I'll repeat the questions back so that you can hear them over the mic. Uh, tell me. Uh, they did it to increase body count uh, because there was a bonus paid for each civilian killed. But that's a separate story. I prefer to talk about that one privately after the after the talk. Any questions on the on the drugs element? Yes. Sure. Um, the question was, what are the kind of category of people? What uh, what's the demographic for, for these drug users? The the, demo, the best data that I have is from uh, a survey carried out by a friend of mine called the, the Global Drug Survey, and in it he found that 12% of his respondents were taking it, and they were aged between 18 and 25 mainly, um, and then they kind of tapered off with maybe kind of 15 to 20% of users from the the, the main body who were between 25 and 35. So young people, urban people, educated people, all sorts of people. I mean, it's kind of from 18 to 25, pretty much the same as a standard drugs. But uh, yeah, that's, that's about the age group and, and the, the, the range. Yes? Would you classify opiate painkillers as a legal harm, given that it's an epidemic both in terms of use and death in this country? Would I classify opiates, uh, legal opiates, as a uh, Legal high, yes, I think in many ways it actually meets the it meets the credentials. Um, it's the distribution of them is is different. It's actually much more organised. Um, the production of them is, uh, is is of a higher quality. It's of a you know it's it's much more widespread. I think certainly if you look at the the, the use levels in the US where these drugs are mainly prescribed. Yes, I think that I, I don't know whether I describe it as an epidemic. I haven't done the research. And I, I do tend to sort of shy away from those those kind of those phrases, but certainly I would describe them as a it, it's a it's a legal alternative to heroin. And when people don't have heroin, when there is no heroin available, people will very often um, take oxycontin or hydrocodone or any of these synthetic opiate uh, replacements. So, but there are even on the on the international legal highs market, there are some alternatives currently, such as there's a drug called Odesmethyltramadol, which is tramadol with just a couple of different functional groups attached. Another drug called AH7921, which has killed a few people in the UK already, which is a, a drug that targets the opiate receptors. So yeah, definitely. Any more questions? Downstage. I did that this morning. <laughs> you can, it's a very, it's a very well designed and functional site. And you see my name on the top right hand corner, uh, Mike Power. Underneath it says settings. You can choose to display it in about 50 different currencies. So they have a currency converter on site. You know. So <laughs> yeah, that's uh, that's the price. In, in bitcoins, currently that's about bitcoins about six hundred dollars today, I think, or four hundred pounds, something like that. So the, the, the Bitcoin story is a really, a really fascinating one. It, it's one that I think will become, uh, it will become very much more uh, prominent in the next few years. This is a, a currency that you can send from one person to another, anywhere in the world. Nobody can trace it. You can buy it anonymously in the US with cash, in, you know, in corner stores in certain, certain ways, and, and various other kind of grocery stores. And then you, know, you can send this, send this money around and have illegal drugs like this posted to your house. Any other questions? Yes. Do you think that um, the solutions are they're necessarily global solutions? That's a really good question. The problem is global, uh, or rather, the I think problem is a is a difficult word. But the the situation, the phenomenon is global. The phenomenon of uh, of drug taking is global. The phenomenon of uh, drug prohibition is global, and the, pro the 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 phenomenon of legal highs and of uh, of dark web markets. That also is uh, global. 
So those, those categories are, are all there. I don't really see how you could have a global solution to such a disparate problem as this. And it's, it's also very localized. So, you know, in, in, the, in the US, you have a huge or a much larger problem with methamphetamine, uh, rates of usage of methamphetamine than we do in the UK. So what's good in the US isn't going to work there. But again, what's the, when we talk about problem, uh, what's the solution? You know, it's, is your definition of a solution legalization or is your definition the eradication of all drugs? What, what, would your, what would your sort of suggestion be? Indeed. Yeah, I think that um, I think that the the parameters of the solutions and the, the solutions have to be radical. I think that from what I've discovered, from what I've researched, every single step that we take to try to control drugs increases the production of drugs. It increases the production, the price goes lower and the quality goes higher. So what we're doing currently doesn't work. So I think that we have to just look at it and say Let's, let's actually find a way to, to reduce the harm of drugs. Let's look at the way, a way to take the, the money out of the hands of criminals and gangsters. And let's find a way to increase purity and health information about these drugs so that they're not adulterated, and so that people know what's going to kill them and what's not. I think that that's, the, the, the parameter has to be health. You know, views on drug legalization are subjective. Health is not subjective. We need to protect people's health. To me, that's the... That's the guiding principle. We should keep people healthy and alive. So that's you know that's the broadest and simplest paradigm and kind of parameter that I can think of. Yes. I think that the, I think the health community <coughs> excuse me, certainly have a, a leading role to play. <coughs> what we're looking at here is people taking chemicals that affect their health. So of course they have to have uh, a leading role. I mean, let's look at a, a situation with, we have cannabis, which is less harmful than alcohol, but one is sold taxed and is very profitable for international corporations, and one is banned. Now, I want to see evidence-based policy. I want to see policy that consults with user groups and that consults with, uh, with communities and that consults with, with the medical profession, certainly. And yes, I do think that the medical community has a leading role to play in this. Rather than a kind of a justice or a, a, a punitive or you know, a prison, or uh, jailing people doesn't keep them healthy. You know? Helping them to remove their addiction or helping them to make more rational choices or to make safer choices in their drug use will save us money. It will save us money and it is a more, a less uh, problematic approach, I think. Heroin is part of my story at the beginning. The question was, is heroin part of my story? Heroin is part of my story at the beginning when I described that heroin was actually one of the first designer drugs. Heroin was created uh, in the laboratory uh, in, I'd need, I've outsourced my memory to my book, I'd need to, <laughs> I'd need to consult. And then marketed in the 1890s. Yeah, and so this drug was actually invented. Heroin was invented, believe it or not, as a way to help people avoid addiction. It was to help them wean them off morphine. And so the design of drug industry, it feels like it really came along in the 1980s with ecstasy. That was when the time was first used. But really, design of drugs, a design of drug is just a, it's a chemical. It's a chemical that's been worked from the laboratory. So heroin was the original design of drug. And then immediately, again, interestingly to note, as soon as heroin was banned, um, legal versions of heroin were created with various other functional groups and benzyl groups attached and protyl groups. So, the story of chemists manipulating drugs to, uh, to circumvent national and international drug control, it's as old as the hills, but it's, it's, it is coming to prominence once more. Yes? Yeah. 
Ja. The first part of your question, what makes a drug legal or illegal, it's, it's really broad and it's, it's, it's huge. Each country has its own drug laws and then each country is a signatory to the United Nations Convention which bans the 234 drugs that I mentioned before. So each country has its own drug laws and then each of those drug laws is kind of different. Now that's part of the story. What's interesting is that as the internet has kind of destroyed time, space and national borders, um, the drug laws really don't have much weight, they don't have any relevance. So there are drugs that you can buy in Spain which are legal in Spain but illegal in France, in the next country. So that's, that's one kind of key thing that the internet has changed. It's, it's made drug laws redundant, it's made them unenforceable in certain ways because you can just have them posted, you know. The United Kingdom has like 80 million pieces of post per day. That's the United Kingdom or one small island in Europe. Think about that in like a, an American context. So postal order drugs is a, is a, a key part of this. Um, so that's what makes drugs legal or illegal. It's just the decision of each country based upon, well, frankly, arbitrary um, kind of uh, parameters. Um, the next part of your question was about decriminalization through Latin America. Well, we look at Uruguay and we see that the, the, the presence of, of, Uruguay, of Uruguay has specifically um, attempted to remove marijuana cannabis from the, from, the, from the band list. And he said, okay, let's take it out of the hands of gangsters by selling it at a dollar a gram. Let's sell it for less than the gangsters. Let's undercut organized crime. Now that's really clever, that's really smart. That's like, how, what better way to, to, to prevent somebody operating in a market than to take away their profits? And you know, Uruguay hasn't fallen into the sea and society hasn't collapsed. Um, you know, the states of Washington and Colorado haven't ground to a halt because of the recreational use of marijuana. You know, it's, I mean, even the name marijuana is a, a, an old racist construct. It's actually cannabis, obviously. Marijuana was what the Mexican workers uh, called cannabis. And so back in that era, the, the name was used in order to demonize the drug rather than it's being seen as a simple, a simple, you know, relaxing smoke. So, yeah. Uh, Throughout Latin America, uh, in Mexico, they're considered, they have decriminalized marijuana and they, they have decriminalized personal possession of cocaine and ecstasy. Colombia is arguing for the same and they have decriminalized around those, around cannabis and uh, cocaine. And I think that that will be seen, I think that we'll see a domino effect as each country uh, basically defies the United States and defies the United Nations and puts in place their own experimental drug policy, which let's face it, is a response to policy not working. In which other area of public policy do we see that it doesn't work, yet we persist with it? it we don't have that, that mentality in any other area of public policy. It's like if we were educating people and they couldn't speak French or English at the end of five years in school, we would change the system. After 60 years of the war on drugs, we have more drugs on sale, we have more profits, we have more death and more destruction than was caused before. So we have a policy that's discredited and doesn't work, but we persist with it for, well, who knows why? Yes. Sorry, we've had one from you. I'm going to take one from the guy at the back. Yes. Oh, sorry. Yeah, you're going to have to really shout. Oh, okay. Uh, so you think the popularity of the drugs in Mexico is as strong as our lives? Is it the drugs? I'm so sorry, I can't quite hear you. Do I think that the popularity of the internet has said that, oh, I'm so sorry. Ah, excuse me. Um, I, think that the, I think that the internet helps communities coalesce and I think it helps create a kind of, uh, a kind of coalition of, of consciousness. I think that it helps people come together and to, to, to create communities. And yeah, I think that that's contributed to the, this argument. I think, the internet has created a smaller world where you can find out about policy in Uruguay, like that. You know, so yeah, I think it, I think it possibly has. Any more questions? Right at the back, but you're going to have to come forward and shout. Them.
Yeah, okay. Yeah, I think I might have skipped over that bit. Um, I said that I created a new drug, and you, you asked what I did next. I wrote a story about it. I wrote a story, I wrote an 8,000 word story about how easy it is to make and to create a new drug. I mean, I didn't commercialize it, I didn't market it, but I did ask the guy for uh, a kilo. I said, how much would a kilo be? And he told me it would be not very much money. If I wanted to, I could have taken that drug, sold it in the United Kingdom completely legally, and I would be a millionaire today. Instantly, in the space of probably, I'd say, two months. Yeah, completely legal tax. I'd pay my taxes, I'm a respectable citizen, you know. <laughs> So, yeah, no, I, uh, I, didn't, I didn't do anything for that. I, it's in my drawer at home. I was going to send it to a, to a laboratory, a different laboratory for, for the guy's toxicology and poison centre, but I was quite busy over Christmas and I didn't get a chance. <laughs> but, yeah, it's still, it's still a home in my... In fact, you remind me, I need to get it sent. I need it out of the house. <laughs> it might get banned and then I'm going to be in trouble, you know? Any more questions? Yeah, go on. Very often, sorry, you, you, your, your point was that your, your question was that I, I argue that health should have a greater hand in drug policy, but many times people are addicted to, lead, to, to, to legal drugs from hospitals. That's true. But really what's happening there is that those drugs are being diverted. It's not people who are being prescribed them. The majority of those who are addicted to prescription opiates or tranquilizers or benzodiazepines, they're actually diverted and just bought illicitly on the, on the black market or they're bought you know, from friends or anything like that. So, what I think is important to kind of to, to, to establish in any discussion around this, nothing will fix everything. No legalization, having heroin vending machines on the street is not going to fix anything. Having licensed premises where you can buy cocaine of various purities is not going to solve the drug problem. What it will solve is it will, it will instead uh, improve the situation incrementally. It will make uh, drug policy more rational. It won't stop people taking drugs. I mean, in my book, one of the first things I, I, start, I, I looked into was the, the first, what was the first ever recorded use of drugs? It was 9,000 years ago. 9,000 years ago in Thailand, uh, someone was found, uh, they found with carbon dated uh, a quid, a kind of a, a, a pouch of, of a stimulant that someone was chewing. They found this in a cave 9,000 years ago. It's, it's a human instinct to take drugs. I would guarantee that everyone in this room has taken drugs today. I mean, there's a vat of coffee over there. Now, you know, now 200 milligrams of caffeine it would put me right on edge. I can't, I can't drink three espressos, you know. If, I, if you were to take all of the coffee, all of the caffeine in that, in that jug over there and concentrate it into one small cup, it would kill you. If you got the cigarette, if you took a cigarette and you extracted all of the, uh, all of the alkaloid, all of the nicotine from it, it would kill you. You can kill a horse with a packet of cigarettes. You know, so it's about dosage, it's about information, it's about behaviour. And what we need to do in, I think, in the future with drug policy is to look at behaviour, to look at how people are harmed by their own behaviour and instead offer them solutions, offer them options, rather than having uh, drug consumption as an illicit or illegal or dangerous activity, have it as, well, exactly as it is, a consumer choice. And it's a consumer choice with exactly the same risks as drinking too much alcohol. It's a, it's a lifestyle choice which has the same danger levels as, for example, ecstasy. Ecstasy use in the UK was famously analysed by uh, one of the government's leading physicians. And he found that using ecstasy was about as dangerous as horseback riding. So your danger from consuming MDMA is about as dangerous as going out on a horse. So why do we not ban horse riding? You know, I'm not arguing that ecstasy is a safe drug. I'm not arguing that it's a great thing to do with your life. What I'm arguing is that we don't have, we don't have a clear view because we have this moralistic view of drug use. We have this moralistic view of drugs being evil, wrong, or kind of countercultural. We projected a whole bunch of stuff that isn't true onto chemicals. They're just chemicals, They're just carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. Around it all, we have this cultural and this kind of this. It's, it's just a, a projection of, of cultural values onto chemicals. I think strip that away, make it into a health issue, 
and then from there we can have a rational forward thinking policy. Daniel. Sure. In, in, the, in, in the early 2000s, um, Portugal had a huge heroin problem. There were open-air heroin markets and open-air kind of areas of the city where people were openly injecting heroin. And the, the Portuguese government decided rightly that this was, it was the, wrong, the wrong kind of society to have, or the wrong kind of social scene to have. And Portugal um, basically decriminalised all drugs and they offered people help and health assistance. Um, in that time, injecting rates of heroin use, I think, have gone down by 80% because people have been brought into a system, brought into a kind of uh, a treatment option. Uh, and as well as that, what else has gone on over there? Injecting rates have really dropped and also rate, new rates of HIV transmission are down by 80%. So, you know, usage levels didn't go up. Suddenly, all of Portugal didn't start injecting heroin into themselves because they weren't going to go to jail for it. But instead, they were healthier. So that's, that's the Portuguese model, which has been to decriminalise and there the impact it's had. Then the, uh, the New Zealand model is interesting. It's, a, it's an experimental uh, step that New Zealand has taken. Now, New Zealand is so far away that you can't really get drugs in New Zealand. People make their own drugs there. They make their own crystal meth. So um, the way that the, the market's developed out there in the last few years, because New Zealand's so isolated, in, in the words of one guy that I know in New Zealand, he said the cocaine bowl doesn't stop in New Zealand, you know. So over the years, the, the New Zealand uh, kind of drug uh, using culture has been very interested in legal highs. Now, New Zealand became so fed up, they were so kind of completely over the fact that every time a drug was banned, a new one would come to take its place, and they couldn't seem to stamp out this game of chemical whack-a-mole. And they said, OK, let's instead put the onus on the manufacturers. And now in New Zealand, manufacturers can sell uh, a new drug, uh, a new legal drug, so long as it has actually passed various basic health tests. Now, that's a radical and new innovation, and it hasn't actually been you know, tested to the, to the limit yet. It's only been in place for about a year. But it's a brave step, it's an innovation, and it's the kind of thinking, I think, that we need in the internet era to kind of to move the debate beyond legal and illegal, beyond you know, prison or no prison. It's like, let's, let's look at what people want to do. Some people want to take drugs. We need to get over that. We need to just accept that some people sometimes will take drugs. That's just, it's been going on for 9,000 years. In the modern context, it's been going on for 50 years. People take drugs, it's not a big deal. You know, it's not something that I think is something that is laudatory. It's, it's just a fact of life. It's, people take drugs in the same way as they read books. You know? Not all drug use is problematic. But all drug policy is predicated on the assumption that people who take drugs are addicted or in trouble or any number of things. But there is lots of different reasons for taking drugs and for selling and buying them, mainly economics. And if there's any more questions, I'll take maybe one more. Do I speak about psychedelics in my book? Yes, I do. Um, I think that psychedelics are a really interesting um, case study in, in, in all drug policy. Because if you look at a psychedelic um, such as mescaline, you know, or uh, psilocybin, mescaline extracted or taken from peyote cactus, it's been used for thousands of years by Native American people. And there have been studies done uh, which show that they actually have higher levels of mental health those who have used mescaline extensively on hundreds of occasions through their life than those who didn't, you know? Obviously that's taken in, a, it's the context that I think is interesting with psychedelics and with drugs. Psychedelics, just when they're taken, I think just randomly, I'm sure that they're not very, uh, not very helpful substances, but I think in a ritualistic or kind of in a, kind of, you know, a shamanistic environment, for some people and for some communities and for some cultures, it's a positive thing. And we can't argue against that because the data's there and the, the, the history is there. 
So yeah, I do talk about psychedelics. I talk about the fact that the new psychedelics which are replacing the banned psychedelics are actually far more dangerous. You know, you can't toxicologically overdose on psilocybin. You can't eat enough magic mushrooms to die. You just can't do it. You'll turn into a frog first, you know. But, you, you know, you can quite easily die from many of the new legal psychedelics which are being sold all over the internet right now. Drugs which have names like Chemical Soup, 25i, MBOME. These drugs are LSD replacements, legal in much of the USA. And they're killing people because they're really potent. So, yeah, my, drugs, my, my book covers all psychedelics from the very first LSD trip and the very first mescaline trip by a Tory politi a conservative politician on camera, which is a fun story, um, right through to Albert Hoffman inventing LSD in 1943 and right up to 2013. So, yeah, um, everything's in there, all of that. So that was uh, really informative and really enjoyable Q&A. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you for coming.